You're listening to Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in Season 3 of Weekend Reads, we will be making our way through the 1922 abridgment of Sir James Fraser's The Golden Bough. You can visit MidwestCovencast.com to find podcast extras, including a free online copy of the text. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on Patreon for access to additional materials, like a serialized official Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads ebook with additional notes about the text and some editorial modernizations straight from, well, me. Now, Coven, it is time to cozy up with your coffee or tea and enjoy this episode of Weekend Reads. Chapter 11 The Influence of the Sexes on Vegetation. From the preceding examination of the spring and summer festivals of Europe, we may infer that our rude forefathers personified the powers of vegetation as male and female, and attempted, on the principle of homeopathic or imitative magic, to quicken the growth of trees and plants by representing the marriage of the sylvan deities in the persons of a king and queen of May, a Whitsun bridegroom and bride, and so forth. Such representations are accordingly no mere symbolic or allegorical dramas, pastoral plays designed to amuse or instruct a rustic audience. They were charms intended to make the woods to grow green, the fresh grass to sprout, the corn to shoot, and the flowers to blow. And it was natural to suppose that the more closely the mock marriage of the leaf-clad or flower-decked mummers aped the real marriage of the woodland sprites, the more effective would be the charm. Accordingly, we may assume with a high degree of probability that the profligacy which notoriously attended these ceremonies was at one time not an accidental excess, but an essential part of the rites, and that in the opinion of those who performed them, the marriage of the trees and plants could not be fertile without the real union of the human sexes. At the present day, it might perhaps be vain to look in civilized Europe for customs of this sort observed for the explicit purpose of promoting the growth of vegetation. But ruder races in other parts of the world have consciously employed the intercourse of the sexes as a means to ensure the fruitfulness of the earth. And some rites, which are still, or were till lately, kept up in Europe, can be reasonably explained only as stunted relics of a similar practice. The following facts will make this plain. For four days before they committed the seed to the earth, the peoples of Central America kept apart from their wives, in order that on the night before planting they might indulge their passions to the fullest extent. Certain persons are even said to have been appointed to perform the sexual act at the very moment when the first seeds were deposited in the ground. The use of their wives at that time was indeed enjoined upon the people of the priests as a religious duty, in default of which it was not lawful to sow the seed. The only possible explanation of this custom seems to be that the Indians confused the process by which human beings reproduce their kind with the process by which plants discharge the same function, and fancied that by resorting to the former they were simultaneously forwarding the latter. In some parts of Java, at the season when the bloom will soon be on the rice, the husbandman and his wife visit their fields by night, and there engage in sexual intercourse for the purpose of promoting the growth of the crop. In the Leti, Sarmata, and some other groups of islands, which lie between the western end of New Guinea and the northern part of Australia, the heathen population regard the sun as the male principle by whom the earth or female principle is fertilized. They call him Upulera or Mr. Sun, and represent him under the form of a lamp made of coconut leaves, which may be seen hanging everywhere in their houses, and in the sacred fig tree. Under the tree lies a large flat stone which serves as a sacrificial tablet. On it the heads of slain foes were, and are still placed in some of the islands. Once a year, at the beginning of the rainy season, Mr. Sun comes down into the holy fig tree to fertilize the earth, and to facilitate his descent, a ladder with seven rungs is considerately placed at his disposal. It is set up under the tree, and is adorned with carved figures of the birds whose shrill clarion heralds the approach of the sun in the east. On the occasion pigs and dogs are sacrificed in profusion, men and women alike indulge in Saturnalia, and the mystic union of the sun and the earth is dramatically represented in public, amid song and dance, by the real union of the sexes under the tree. The object of the festival, we are told, is to produce rain, 
plenty of food and drink, abundance of cattle and children, and riches from grandfather son. They pray that he may make every she-goat to cast two or three young, the people to multiply, the dead pigs to be replaced by living pigs, the empty rice baskets to be filled, and so on. And to induce him to grant their requests, they offer him pork and rice liquor, and invite him to fall too. In the Babar Islands, a special flag is hoisted at this festival as a symbol of the creative energy of the sun. It is of white cotton, about nine feet high, and consists of the figure of a man in an appropriate attitude. It would be unjust to treat these orgies as a mere outburst of unbridled passion. No doubt, they are deliberately and solemnly organized as essential to the fertility of the earth and the welfare of man. The same means which are thus adopted to stimulate the growth of the crops are naturally employed to ensure the fruitfulness of trees. In some parts of Amboina, when the state of the clove plantation indicates that the crop is likely to be scanty, the men go naked to the plantations by night, and there seek to fertilize the trees precisely as they would impregnate women, while at the same time they call out for more cloves. This is supposed to make the trees bear fruit more abundantly." The Baganda of Central Africa believe so strongly in the intimate relation between the intercourse of the sexes and the fertility of the ground that among them a barren wife is generally sent away, because she is supposed to prevent her husband's garden from bearing fruit. On the contrary, a couple who have given proof of extraordinary fertility by becoming the parents of twins are believed by the Baganda to be endowed with a corresponding power of increasing the fruitfulness of the plantain trees, which furnish them with their stable food. Some little time after the birth of the twins, a ceremony is performed, the object of which clearly is to transmit the reproductive virtue of the parents to the plantains. The mother lies down on her back in the thick grass near the house and places a flower of the plantain between her legs. Then her husband comes and knocks the flower away with his genital member. Further, the parents go through the country performing dances in the gardens of favored friends, apparently for the purpose of causing the plantain trees to bear fruit more abundantly. In various parts of Europe, customs have prevailed both at spring and harvest, which are clearly based on the same crude notion that the relation of the human sexes to each other can be so used as to quicken the growth of plants. For example, in the Ukraine on St. George's Day, the 23rd of April, the priest in his robes, attended by his acolytes, goes out to the fields of the village, where the crops are beginning to show green above the ground, and blesses them. After that, the young married people lie down in couples on the sown fields and roll several times over on them, in the belief that this will promote the growth of the crops. In some parts of Russia, the priest himself is rolled by women over the sprouting crop, and that without regard to the mud and holes which he may encounter in his beneficent progress. If the shepherd resists or remonstrates, his flock murmurs, Little father, you do not really wish us well. You do not wish us to have corn, although you do wish to live on our corn. In some parts of Germany, at the harvest, the men and women who have reaped the corn roll together on the field. This again is probably a mitigation of an older and ruder custom designed to impart fertility to the fields by methods like those resorted to by the peoples of Central America long ago, and by the cultivators of rice in Java at the present time. To the student who cares to track the devious course of the human mind in its gropings after truth, it is of some interest to observe that the same theoretical belief in the sympathetic influence of the sexes on vegetation, which has led some peoples to indulge their passions as a means of fertilizing the earth, has led others to seek the same end by directly opposite means. From the moment that they sowed the maize till the time that they reaped it, the Indians of Nicaragua lived chastely keeping apart from their wives, and sleeping in a separate place. They ate no salt and drank neither cocoa nor chicha, the fermented liquor made from maize. In short, the season was for them, as the Spanish historian observes, a time of abstinence. To this day, some of the Indian tribes of Central America practice continence for the purpose of thereby promoting the growth of the crops. Thus, we are told that before sowing the maize, the Kekchi Indians sleep apart from their wives and eat no flesh for five days, while among the Lenquineros and Cabaneros, the period of abstinence from these carnal pleasures extends to 13 days. 
So among some of the Germans of Transylvania, it is a rule that no man may sleep with his wife during the whole of the time that he is engaged in sowing his fields. The same rule is observed at Kalostashig in Hungary. The people think that if the custom were not observed, the corn would be mildewed. Similarly, a central Australian headman of the Kadish tribe strictly abstains from marital relations with his wife all the time that he is performing magical ceremonies to make the grass grow, for he believes that a breach of this rule would prevent the grass seed from sprouting properly. In some of the Melanesian islands, when the yam vines are being trained, the men sleep near the gardens and never approach their wives. Should they enter the garden after breaking this rule of continence, the fruits of the garden would be spoilt. If we ask why it is that similar beliefs should logically lead, among different peoples, to such opposite modes of conduct as strict chastity and more or less open debauchery, the reason, as it presents itself to the primitive mind, is perhaps not very far to seek. If rude man identifies himself in a manner with nature, if he fails to distinguish the impulses and processes in himself from the methods which nature adopts to ensure the reproduction of plants and animals, he may leap to one of two conclusions. Either he may infer that by yielding to his appetites, he will thereby assist in the multiplication of plants and animals, or he may imagine that the vigor which he refuses to expend in reproducing his own kind will form, as it were, a store of energy whereby other creatures, whether vegetable or animal, will somehow benefit in propagating their species. Thus, from the same crude philosophy, the same primitive notions of nature and life, the savage may derive by different channels a rule either of profligacy or asceticism. To readers bred in religion, which is saturated with the ascetic idealism of the East, the explanation which I have given of the rule of continence observed under certain circumstances by rude or savage peoples may seem far-fetched and improbable. They may think that moral purity, which is so intimately associated in their minds with the observance of such a rule, furnishes a sufficient explanation of it. They may hold with Milton that chastity in itself is a noble virtue, and that the restraint which it imposes on one of the strongest impulses of our animal nature marks out those who can submit to it as men raised above the common herd, and therefore worthy to receive the seal of the divine approbation. However natural this mode of thought may seem to us, it is utterly foreign and indeed incomprehensible to the savage. If he resists on occasion the sexual instinct, it is from no high idealism, no ethereal aspiration after moral purity, but for the sake of some ulterior, yet perfectly definite and concrete object, to gain which he is prepared to sacrifice, the immediate gratification of his senses." That this is or may be so, the examples I have cited are amply sufficient to prove. They show that where the instinct of self-preservation, which manifests itself chiefly in the search for food, conflicts or appears to conflict with the instinct which conduces to the propagation of the species, the former instinct, as the primary and more fundamental, is capable of overmastering the latter. In short, the savage is willing to restrain his sexual propensity for the sake of food, Another object for the sake of which he consents to exercise the same self-restraint is victory in war. Not only the warrior in the field, but his friends at home will often bridle their sensual appetites from a belief that by doing so they will the more easily overcome their enemies. The fallacy of such a belief, like the belief that the chastity of the sower conduces to the growth of the seed, is plain enough to us. Yet perhaps the self-restraint which these and the like beliefs, vain and false as they are, have imposed on mankind, has not been without its utility in bracing and strengthening the breed. For strength of character in the race, as in the individual, consists mainly in the power of sacrificing the present to the future, of disregarding the immediate temptations of ephemeral pleasure for more distant and lasting sources of satisfaction. The more the power is exercised, the higher and stronger becomes the character, till the height of heroism is reached in men who renounce the pleasures of life, and even life itself, for the sake of keeping or winning for others, perhaps in distant ages, the blessings of freedom and truth. Chapter 12. The Sacred Marriage. Subsection 1. Diana as a Goddess of Fertility. 
we have seen that according to a widespread belief, which is not without a foundation in fact, plants reproduce their kinds through the sexual union of male and female elements, and that on the principle of homeopathic or imitative magic, this reproduction is supposed to be stimulated by the real or mock marriage of men and women, who masquerade for the time being as spirits of vegetation. Such magical dramas have played a great part in the popular festivals of Europe, and based as they are on a very crude conception of natural law, it is clear that they must have been handed down from a remote antiquity. We shall hardly therefore err in assuming that they date from a time when the forefathers of the civilized nations of Europe were still barbarians herding their cattle and cultivating patches of corn in the clearings of the vast forests, which then covered the greater part of the continent from the Mediterranean to the Arctic Ocean. But if these old spells and enchantments for the growth of leaves and blossoms of grass and flowers and fruit have lingered down to our own time in the shape of pastoral plays and popular merrymakings, is it not reasonable to suppose that they survived in less attenuated forms some two thousand years ago among the civilized peoples of antiquity? Or, to put it otherwise, is it not likely that in certain festivals of the ancients we may be able to detect the equivalents of our May Day Whitsuntide and midsummer celebrations, with this difference that in those days the ceremonies had not yet dwindled into mere shows and pageants, but were still religious or magical rites, in which the actors consciously supported the high parts of gods and goddesses. Now, in the first chapter of this book, we found reason to believe that the priest who bore the title of the king of the wood at Nemi had for his mate the goddess of the grove, Diana herself. May not he and she, as king and queen of the wood, have been serious counterparts of the merry mummers who play the king and queen of May, the Whitsun bridegroom and bride in modern Europe? And may not their union have been yearly celebrated in the theogamy or divine marriage? Such dramatic weddings of gods and goddesses, as we shall see presently, were carried out as solemn religious rites in many parts of the ancient world. Hence, there is no intrinsic improbability in the supposition that the sacred grove at Nemi may have been the scene of an annual ceremony of this sort. Direct evidence that it was so there is none, but analogy pleads in favor of the view, as I shall now endeavor to show. Diana was essentially a goddess of the woodlands, at Ceres was a goddess of the corn, and Bacchus a god of the vine. Her sanctuaries were commonly in groves, indeed every grove was sacred to her, and she is often associated with the forest god Sylvanus in dedications. But whatever her origin may have been, Diana was not always a mere goddess of trees. Like her Greek sister Artemis, she appears to have developed into a personification of the teeming life of nature, both animal and vegetable. As mistress of the greenwood, she would naturally be thought to own the beasts, whether wild or tame, that range through it, lurking for their prey in its gloomy depths, munching the fresh leaves and shoots among the boughs, or cropping the herbage in the open glades and dells. Thus, she might come to be the patron goddess both of hunters and herdsmen, just as Selvanus was the god not only of woods, but of cattle. Similarly, in Finland, the wild beasts of the forest were regarded as the herds of the woodman god Tapio, and of his stately and beautiful wife. No man might slay one of these animals without the gracious permission of their divine owners. Hence the hunter prayed to the sylvan deities, and vowed rich offerings to them, if they would drive the game across his path. And cattle also seemed to have enjoyed the protection of those spirits of the woods, both when they were in their stalls and while they strayed in the forest. Before the Gaios of Sumatra hunt deer, wild goats, or wild pigs with hounds in the woods, they deem it necessary to obtain the leave of the unseen lord of the forest. This is done according to a prescribed form by a man who has special skill in woodcraft. He lays down a quid of betel before a stake, which is cut in a particular way to represent the lord of the wood, and having done so he prays to the spirit to signify his consent or refusal. In his treatise on hunting, Arian tells us that the Celts used to offer an annual sacrifice to Artemis on her birthday, purchasing the sacrificial victim with the fines which they had paid into the treasury for every fox, hare, and roe that they had killed in the course of the year. The custom clearly implied that the wild beasts belonged to the goddess and that she must be compensated for their slaughter. 
But Diana was not merely a patroness of wild beasts, a mistress of woods and hills, of lonely glades and sounding rivers, conceived as the moon, and especially, it would seem, as the yellow harvest moon. She filled the farmer's grange with goodly fruits, and heard the prayers of women in travail. In her sacred grove at Nemi, as we have seen, she was especially worshipped as a goddess of childbirth, who bestowed offspring on men and women. Thus Diana, like the Greek Artemis, with whom she was constantly identified, may be described as a goddess of nature in general, and of fertility in particular. We need not wonder, therefore, that in her sanctuary, on the Aventine, she was represented by an image copied from the many-breasted idol of the Aphasian Artemis, with all its crowded emblems of exuberant fecundity. Hence, too, we can understand why an ancient Roman law attributed to King Tullus Hostilius prescribed that, when incest had been committed, an expiatory sacrifice should be offered by the pontiffs in the grove for Diana. For we know that the crime of incest is commonly supposed to cause a dearth. Hence, it would be meant that atonement for the offense should be made to the goddess of fertility." Now on the principle that the goddess of fertility must herself be fertile, it behooved Diana to have a male partner. Her mate, if the testimony of Servius may be trusted, was that Verbius, who had his representative, or perhaps rather his embodiment, in the king of the wood at Nemi. The aim of their union would be to promote the fruitfulness of the earth, of animals, of mankind, and it might naturally be thought that this object would be more surely attained if the sacred nuptials were celebrated every year, the parts of the divine bride and bridegroom being played either by their images or by living persons. No ancient writer mentions that this was done in the grove at Nemi, but our knowledge of the Eretian ritual is so scanty that the want of information on this head can hardly count as a fatal objection to the theory. That theory, in the absence of direct evidence, must necessarily be based on the analogy of similar customs practiced elsewhere. Some modern examples of such customs, more or less degenerate, were described in the last chapter. Here we shall consider their ancient counterparts. Subsection 2. The Marriage of the Gods. At Babylon, the imposing sanctuary of Bell Rose, like a pyramid above the city in a series of eight towers or stories, planted one on the top of the other, on the highest tower, reached by an ascent, which wound about all the rest, there stood a spacious temple, and in the temple a great bed magnificently draped and cushioned with a golden table beside it. In the temple no image was to be seen, and no human being passed the night there, save a single woman whom, according to the Chaldean priests, the god chose from among all the women of Babylon. They said that the deity himself came into the temple at night and slept in the great bed, and the woman, as a consort of the god, might have no intercourse with mortal man. At Thebes, in Egypt, a woman slept in the temple of Ammon as the consort of the god, and like the human wife of Bel at Babylon, she was said to have no commerce with a man. In Egyptian texts, she is often mentioned as the divine consort, and usually she has no less a personage than the queen of Egypt herself. For according to the Egyptians, their monarchs were actually begotten by the god Amon, who assumed for the time being the form of the reigning king, and in that disguise had intercourse with the queen. The divine procreation is carved and painted in great detail on the walls of two of the oldest temples in Egypt, those of Deir el Bahari and Luxor, and the inscriptions attached to the paintings leave no doubt as to the meaning of the scenes. At Athens, the god of the vine, Dionysus, was annually married to the queen, and it appears that the consummation of the divine union, as well as the spousals, was enacted at the ceremony. But whether the part of the god was played by a man or an image, we do not know. We learn from Aristotle that the ceremony took place in the old official residence of the king, known as the cattle stall, which stood near the Pratanium or town hall on the northeastern slope of the Acropolis. The object of the marriage can hardly have been any other than that of ensuring the fertility of the vines and the other fruit trees, of which Dionysus was the god. Thus, both in form and in meaning, the ceremony would answer to the nuptials of the king and queen of May. 
and the great mysteries solemnized at Eleusis in the month of September, the union of the sky god Zeus with the corn goddess Demeter appears to have been represented by the union of the Hierophant with the priestess of Demeter, who acted the parts of god and goddess. But their intercourse was only dramatic or symbolical, for the Hierophant had temporarily deprived himself of his virility by an application of hemlock. The torches having been extinguished, the pair descended into a murky place, while the throng of worshippers awaited in anxious suspense the result of the mystic congress on which they believed their own salvation to depend. After a time, the hierophant reappeared, and in a blaze of light silently exhibited to the assembly a reaped ear of corn, the fruit of the divine marriage. Then, in a loud voice, he proclaimed, Queen Brimo has brought forth sacred boy Brimo's by which he meant, the mighty one has brought forth the mighty. The corn mother, in fact, had given birth to her child, the corn, and her travail pangs were enacted in the sacred drama. This revelation of the reaped corn appears to have been the crowning act of the mysteries. Thus, though the glamour shed round these rites by the poetry and philosophy of later ages, there still looms like a distant landscape through a sunlit haze, a simple rustic festival designed to cover the wide Eleusinian plain with a plenteous harvest by wedding the goddess of the corn to the sky god who fertilized the bare earth with genial showers. Every few years, the people of Plataea in Boeotia held a festival called the Little Daedala, at which they felled an oak tree in an ancient oak forest. Out of the tree, they carved an image, and having dressed it as a bride, they set it on a bullock cart with a bridesmaid beside it. The image seems then to have been drawn to the bank of the river, Asapis, and back to the town, attended by a piping and dancing crowd. Every sixty years, the festival of the great Dedela was celebrated by all the people of Boeotia, and at it all the images, fourteen in number, which had accumulated at the lesser festivals, were dragged on wains in procession to the river Asapis, and then to the top of Mount Sitharon, where they were burnt on a great pyre. The story told to explain the festivals suggests that they celebrated the marriage of Zeus and Hera, represented by the oaken image in bridal array. In Sweden, every year, a life-sized image of Frey, the god of fertility, both animal and vegetable, was drawn about the country in a wagon, attended by a beautiful girl, who was called the god's wife. She acted also as his priestess in this great temple at Uppsala. Wherever the wagon came with the image of the god and his blooming young bride, the people crowded to meet them and offered sacrifices for a fruitful year. Thus the custom of marrying gods, either to images or to human beings, was widespread among the nations of antiquity. The ideas on which such a custom is based are too crude to allow us to doubt the civilized Babylonians, Egyptians, and Greeks inherited it from their barbarous or savage forefathers. This presumption is strengthened when we find rites of a similar kind in vogue among the lower races." Thus, for example, we are told that once upon a time, the Wotayaks of the Malmais district in Russia were distressed by a series of bad harvests. They did not know what to do, but at last concluded that their powerful but mischievous god, Karamet, must be angry at being unmarried. So, a deputation of elders visited the Wotayaks of Kura and came to an understanding with them on the subject. Then they returned home, laid in a large stock of brandy, and having made ready a gaily decked wagon and horses, they drove in procession with bells ringing, as they do when they are fetching home a bride to the sacred grove at Cura. There they ate and drank merrily all night, and next morning they cut a square piece of turf in the grove and took it home with them. After that, though it fared well with the people of Malmas, it fared ill with the people of Cura, for in Malmas the bread was good, but in Cura it was bad. Hence the men of Cura, who had consented to the marriage, were blamed and roughly handled by their indignant fellow villagers. What they meant by this marriage ceremony, says the writer who reports it, it is not easy to imagine. Perhaps, as Bacteru thinks, they meant to marry Karamet to the kindly and fruitful Mukilson the earth wife in order that she might influence him for good when wells are dug in bengal a wooden image of a god is made and married to the goddess of water often the bride destined for the god is not a log or a cloud but a living woman of flesh and blood 
the Indians of a village in Peru had been known to marry a beautiful girl about 14 years of age to a stone shaped like a human being, which they regarded as a god, Huaca. All the villagers took part in the marriage ceremony, which lasted three days and was attended with much revelry. The girl thereafter remained a virgin and sacrificed to the idol for the people. They showed her the utmost reverence and deemed her divine. Every year about the middle of March, when the season for fishing with the dragnet began, the Algonquins and Hurons married their nets to two young girls, aged six and seven. At the wedding feast, the net was placed between the two maidens and was exhorted to take courage and catch many fish. The reason for choosing the bride so young was to make sure they were virgins. The origin of the custom is said to have been this. One year, when the fishing season came round, the Algonquins cast their nets as usual, but took nothing. Surprised at their want of success, they did not know what to make of it, till the soul or genius, Okai, of the net appeared to them in the likeness of a tall, well-built man, who said to them in a great passion, I have lost my wife, and I cannot find one who has known no other man but me. That is why you do not succeed, and why you never will succeed till you give me satisfaction on this head. So the Algonquins held a council and resolved to appease the spirit of the net by marrying him to two such very young girls that he could have no ground of complaint on that score for the future. They did so, and the fishing turned out all that could be wished. The thing got wind among their neighbors, the Hurons, and they adopted the custom. A share of the catch was always given to the families of the two girls who acted as brides of the net for the year. The Oreans of Bengal worship the earth as a goddess and annually celebrate her marriage with the sun god Dharme. At the time when the sal tree is in blossom, the ceremony is as follows. All bathe, then the men repair to the sacred grove, Sarna, while the women assemble at the house of the village priest. After sacrificing some fowls to the sun god and the demon of the grove, the men eat and drink. The priest is then carried back to the village on the shoulders of a strong man. Near the village, the women meet and men wash their feet. With beating of drums and singing, dancing and jumping, all proceed to the priest's house, which has been decorated with leaves and flowers. Then the usual form of marriage is performed between the priest and his wife, symbolizing the supposed union between sun and earth. After the ceremony, all eat and drink and make merry. They dance and sing obscene songs and finally indulge in the vilest orgies. The object is to move the Mother Earth to become fruitful. Thus, the sacred marriage of the sun and earth, personated by the priest and his wife, is celebrated as a charm to ensure the fertility of the ground, and for the same purpose, on the principle of homeopathic magic, the people indulge in licentious orgy. It deserves to be remarked that the supernatural being to whom women are married is often a god or spirit of water. Thus, Mukasa, the god of the Victoria Nyanza Lake, who was propitiated by the Baganda every time they undertook a long voyage, had virgins provided for him to serve as his wives. Like the Vestals, they were bound to chastity, but unlike the Vestals, they seem to have been often unfaithful. The custom lasted until Mwanga was converted to Christianity. The Aikikuyu of British East Africa worship the snake of a certain river, and at intervals of several years, they marry the snake god to women, but especially to young girls. For this purpose, huts are built by order of the medicine men, who there consummate the sacred marriage with the credulous female devotees. If the girls do not repair to the huts of their own accord in sufficient numbers, they are seized and dragged thither to the embraces of the deity. The offspring of these mystic unions appears to be father, on God, Enge. Certainly, there are children among the Akakuyu who pass for children of God. It is said that once, when the inhabitants of Kayeli in Peru on East Indian Island were threatened with destruction by a swarm of crocodiles, they ascribed the misfortune to a passion which the prince of the crocodiles had conceived for a certain girl. Accordingly, they compelled the damsel's father to dress her in bridal array and deliver her over to the clutches of her crocodile lover. A usage of the same sort is reported to have prevailed in the Baldives Islands before the conversion of the inhabitants to Islam. 
The famous Arab traveler, Ibn Battuta, has described the custom and the manner in which it came to an end. He was assured by several trustworthy natives, whose names he gives, that when the people of the islands were idolaters, there appeared to them every month an evil spirit among the jinn, who came from across the sea in the likeness of a ship full of burning lamps. The want of the inhabitants, as soon as they perceived him, was to take a young virgin, and having adorned her, to lead her to the heathen temple that stood on the shore, with a window looking out to sea. There they left the damsel for the night, and when they came back in the morning, they found her a maid no more, and dead. Every month they drew lots, and he upon whom the lot fell gave up his daughter to the genie of the sea." the last of the maidens thus offered to the demon was rescued by a pious berber who by reciting the koran succeeded in driving the genie back into the sea ibn Battuta's narrative of the demon lover and his mortal brides closely resembles a well-known type of folk tale of which versions have been found from japan to anam in the east to senegambia scandinavia and scotland in the west the story varies in details from people to people but as commonly told it runs thus a certain country is infested by a many-headed serpent dragon or other monster which would destroy the whole people if a human victim generally a virgin were not delivered up to him periodically many victims have perished and at last it has fallen to the lot of the king's own daughter to be sacrificed she is exposed to the monster but the hero of the tale generally a young man of humble birth interposes in her behalf slays the monster and receives the hand of the princess as his reward in many of the tales the monster who is sometimes described as a serpent inhabits the water of a sea a lake or a fountain in other versions he is a serpent or dragon who takes possession of the springs of water and only allows the water to flow or the people to make use of it on condition of receiving a human victim it would probably be a mistake to dismiss all these tales as pure inventions of the storyteller Rather, we may suppose that they reflect a real custom of sacrificing girls or women to the wives of water spirits, who are very often conceived as great serpents or dragons. Chapter 13. The Kings of Rome and Alba. Subsection 1. Numa and Egeria. From the foregoing survey of custom and legend, we may infer that the sacred marriage of the powers, both of vegetation and of water, has been celebrated by many peoples for the sake of promoting the fertility of the earth, on which the life of animals and men ultimately depends, and that in such rites the part of the divine bridegroom or bride is often sustained by a man or a woman. The evidence may, therefore, lend some countenance to the conjecture that in the sacred grove at Nemi, where the powers of vegetation and of water manifested themselves in the fair forms of shady woods, tumbling cascades, and glassy lake, a marriage like that of our king and queen of May was annually celebrated between the mortal king of the wood and the mortal queen of the wood, Diana. In this connection, an important figure in the grove was the water nymph Egeria, who was worshipped by pregnant women because she, like Diana, could grant them an easy delivery. From this, it seems fairly safe to conclude that, like many other springs, the water of Egeria was credited with a power of facilitating conception as well as delivery. The votive offerings found on the spot, which clearly refer to the begetting of children, may possibly have been dedicated to Geria rather than to Diana, or perhaps we should rather say that the water nymph Egeria is only another form of the great nature goddess Diana herself, the mistress of sounding rivers as well as umbrageous woods, who had her home by the lake and her mirror in its calm waters, and whose Greek counterpart Artemis loved to haunt mirrors and springs. The identification of Egeria with Diana is confirmed by the statement of Plutarch that Egeria was one of the oak nymphs whom the Romans believed to preside over every green oak grove, for while Diana was a goddess of the woodlands in general, she appears to have been intimately associated with oaks in particular, especially at her sacred grove of Nemi. Perhaps when Egeria was the fairy of a spring that flowed from the roots of a sacred oak, such a spring is said to have gushed from the foot of the great oak at Dodona, and from its murmurous flow the priestess drew oracles. Among the Greeks, a drought of water from certain sacred springs or wells was supposed to confer prophetic powers. This would explain the more than mortal wisdom with which, according to tradition, Egeria inspired her royal husband or lover Numa, 
when we remember how very often in early society the king is held responsible for the fall of rain and the fruitfulness of the earth, it seems hardly rash to conjecture that in the legend of the nuptials of Numa and Egeria, we have a reminiscence of a sacred marriage which the old Roman kings regularly contracted with a goddess of vegetation and water for the purpose of enabling him to discharge his divine or magical functions. In such a rite, the part of the goddess might be played either by an image or a woman, and if by a woman, probably by the queen. If there is any truth in this conjecture, we may suppose that the king and queen of Rome masqueraded as god and goddess at their marriage, exactly as the king and queen of Egypt appear to have done. The legend of Numa and Egeria points to a sacred grove rather than a house as the scene of the nuptial union, which, like the marriage of the king and queen of May, or the vine god and the queen of Athens, may have been annually celebrated as a charm to ensure the fertility not only of the earth, but of man and beast. Now, according to some accounts, the scene of the marriage was no other than the sacred grove of Nemi, and on quite independent grounds, we have been led to suppose that in that same grove, the king of the wood was wedded to Diana. The convergence of the two distinct lines of inquiry suggests that the legendary union of the Roman king with Egeria may have been a reflection or duplicate of the union of the king of the wood with Egeria or her double Diana. This does not imply that the Roman kings ever served as kings of the wood in the Arician grove, but only that they may originally have been invested with a sacred character of the same general kind, and may have held office on similar terms. To be more explicit, it is possible that they reigned, not by right of birth, but in virtue of their supposed divinity as representatives or embodiments of a god, and that as such they mated with a goddess and had to prove their fitness from time to time to discharge their divine functions by engaging in a severe bodily struggle which may often have proved fatal to them leaving the crown to their victorious adversary our knowledge of the roman kingship is far too scanty to allow us to affirm any one of these propositions with confidence but at least there are some scattered hints or indications of similarity in all these respects between the priests of nemi and the kings of rome or perhaps rather between their remote predecessors in the dark ages which preceded the dawn of legend subsection two the king as jupiter in the first place then it would seem that the roman king personated no less a deity than jupiter himself for down to imperial times victorious generals celebrating a triumph and magistrates presiding at the games in the circus wore the costume of jupiter which was borrowed for the occasion from his great temple on the capitol and it has been held with a high degree of probability both by ancients and moderns that in so doing they copied the traditionary attire and insignia of the roman kings they rode a chariot drawn by four laurel crowned horses through the city where every one else went on foot they wore purple robes embroidered or spangled with gold. In the right hand, they bore a branch of laurel, and in the left hand, an ivory scepter topped with an eagle. A wreath of laurel crowned their brows. Their face was reddened with vermilion, and over their head, a slave held a heavy crown of massy gold fashioned in the likeness of oak leaves. In this attire, the simulation of the man to the god comes out above all in the eagle-topped scepter the oaken crown, and the reddened face, for the eagle was the bird of Jove, the oak was his sacred tree, and the face of his image standing in his four-horse chariot on the capital was in like manner regularly dyed red on festivals. Indeed, so important was it deemed to keep the divine features properly rouged that one of the first duties of the censors was to contract for having this done as the triumphal procession always ended in the temple of jupiter on the capitol it was peculiarly appropriate that the head of the victor should be graced by a crown of oak leaves for not only was every oak consecrated to jupiter but the capitoline temple of the god was said to have been built by romulus beside a sacred oak venerated by shepherds to which the king attached the spoils won by him from the enemy's general in battle we are expressly told that the oak crown was sacred to capitoline jupiter a passage of ovid proves that it was regarded as the god's special emblem according to tradition which we have no reason to reject rome was founded by settlers from alba longa a city situated on the slope of the alban hills overlooking the lake and the campagna hence if the roman kings 
claim to be representatives or embodiments of Jupiter, the god of the sky, of the thunder, and of the oak, it is natural to suppose that the kings of Alba, from whom the founder of Rome traced his descent, may have set up the same claim before them. Now the Alban dynasty bore the name of Silvi, or Wood, and it can hardly be without significance that in the vision of the historic glories of Rome revealed to Aeneas in the underworld, Virgil, an antiquary, as well as poet, should represent all the line of Silvi as crowned with oak. A chaplet of oak leaves would thus seem to have been part of the insignia of the old kings of Alba Longa, as of their successors, the kings of Rome. In both cases, it marked the monarch as the human representative of the oak god. The Roman annals record that one of the kings of Alba, Romulus, Remulus, or Amulius Silvius by name, set up for being a god in his own person, the equal or superior of Jupiter. To support his pretensions and overawe his subjects, he constructed machines whereby he mimicked the clap of thunder and the flash of lightning. Diodorus relates that in the season of fruitage, when thunder is loud and frequent, the king commanded his soldiers to drown the roar of heaven's artillery by clashing their swords against their shields. But he paid the penalty of his impiety, for he perished, he and his house, struck by a thunderbolt in the midst of a dreadful storm. Swollen by the rain, the Alban lake rose in flood and drowned his palace. But still, says an ancient historian, when the water is low and the surface unruffled by a breeze, you may see the ruins of the palace at the bottom of the clear lake. Taken along with the similar story of Salmonius, king of Elis, this legend points to a real custom observed by the early kings of Greece and Italy, who, like their fellows in Africa down to modern times, may have been expected to produce rain and thunder for the good of the crops. The priestly king Numa passed for an adept in the art of drawing down lightning from the sky. Mock thunder, we know, has been made by various peoples as a rain charm in modern times. Why should it not have been made by kings in antiquity? Thus, if the kings of Alba and Rome imitated Jupiter as god of the oak by wearing a crown of oak leaves, they seem also to have copied him in his character of a weather god by pretending to make thunder and lightning. And if they did so, it is probable that, like Jupiter in heaven and many kings on earth, they also acted as public rainmakers, wringing showers from the dark sky by their enchantments whenever the parched earth cried out for the refreshing moisture. At Rome, the sluices of heaven were opened by means of a sacred stone, and the ceremony appears to have formed part of the ritual of Jupiter Elysius, the god who elicits from the clouds the flashing lightning and the dripping rain, and who so well fitted to perform the ceremony as the king, the living representative of the sky god. If the kings of Rome aped Capitoline Jove, their predecessors, the kings of Alba, probably laid themselves out to mimic the great lady in Jupiter, who had his seat above the city on the summit of the Alban mountain. Latinus, the legendary ancestor of the dynasty, who said to have been changed into Lady in Jupiter, after vanishing from the world in the mysterious fashion characteristic of the old Latin kings. The sanctuary of the god on the top of the mountain was the religious center of the Latin League, as Alba was its political capital till Rome wrested the supremacy from its ancient rival. Apparently, no temple, in our sense of the word, was ever erected to Jupiter on his holy mountain. As god of the sky and thunder, he appropriately received the homage of his worshippers in the open air. The massive wall, of which some remains, still enclosed the old garden of the Passionist Monastery, seems to have been part of the sacred precinct, which Tarquin the Proud, the last king of Rome, marked out for the solemn annual assembly of the Latin League. The god's oldest sanctuary, on the airy mountain top was a grove, and bearing in mind not merely the special consecration of the oak to Jupiter, but also the traditional oak crown of the Alban kings, and the analogy of the capital line Jupiter at Rome, we may suppose that the trees in the grove were oaks. We know that in antiquity, Mount Algidus, an outlying group of the Alban hills, was covered with dark forests of oak, and among the tribes who belonged to the Latin League in the earliest days, and were entitled to share the flesh of the white bull sacrificed on the Alban mount, there was one whose members styled themselves the men of the oak, doubtless on account of the woods among which they dwelt. But we should err if we pictured to ourselves the country as covered in historical times with an unbroken forest of oaks, 
Theophrastus, has left us a description of the woods of Latium as they were in the 4th century before Christ. He says, The land of the Latins is all moist. The plains produce laurels, myrtles, and wonderful beeches, for they fell trees of such a size that a single stem suffices for the keel of a Tyrrhenian ship. Pines and firs grow in the mountains. What they call the land of Circe is a lofty headland, thickly wooded with oak, myrtle, and luxuriant laurels. The natives say that Circe dwelt there, and they show the grave of Elpinor, from which grow myrtles such as wreaths are made of, whereas the other myrtle trees are tall. Thus, the prospect from the top of the Alban Mount in the early days of Rome must have been very different in some respects from what it is today. The purple Apennines, indeed, in their eternal calm on the one hand, and the shining Mediterranean in its eternal unrest on the other, no doubt, looked then much as they look now, whether bathed in sunshine or checkered by the fleeting shadows of clouds, but instead of the desolate brown expanse of the fever-stricken Campania, spanned by its long lines of ruined aqueducts, like the broken arches of the bridge in the vision of Mirza, the eye must have ranged from woodlands that stretched away mile after mile on all sides till their varied hues of green or autumnal scarlet and gold melted insensibly into the blue of the distant mountains and sea but jupiter did not reign alone on the top of his holy mountain he had his consort with him the goddess juno who was worshipped here under the same title moneta as on the capital at rome as the oak crown was sacred to jupiter and juno on the capital so we may suppose it was on the alban mount from which the capitoline worship was derived thus the oak god would have his oak goddess in the sacred oak grove so at dodona the oak god zeus was coupled with dione whose very name is only a dialectically different form of Juno, and so on. The top of Mount Cithrone, as we have seen, he appears to have been periodically wedded to an oaken image of Hera. It is probable, though it cannot be positively proved, that the sacred marriage of Jupiter and Juno was annually celebrated by all the peoples of the Latin stock in the month which they named after the goddess, the midsummer month of June. If at any time of the year the Romans celebrated the sacred marriage of Jupiter and Juno, as the Greeks commonly celebrated the corresponding marriage of Zeus and Hera, we may suppose that under the Republic the ceremony was either performed over images of the divine pair, or acted by the Flamen Dialis and his wife, the Flaminica, for the Flamen Dialis was the priest of Jove. Indeed, ancient and modern writers have regarded him with much probability as a living image of Jupiter, a human embodiment of the sky god. In earlier times, the Roman king, as representative of Jupiter, would naturally play the part of the heavenly bridegroom at the sacred marriage, while his queen would figure as the heavenly bride. Just as in Egypt, the king and queen masqueraded in the character of deities, and as at Athens, the queen annually wedded the vine god Dionysus. That the Roman king and queen should act the parts of Jupiter and Juno would seem all the more natural, because these deities themselves bore the title of king and queen. Whether that was so or not, the legend of Numa and Agaria appears to embody a reminiscence of a time when the priestly king himself played the part of the divine bridegroom. And as we have seen reason to suppose that the Roman kings personated the oak god, while Geria is expressly said to have been an oak nymph, the story of their union in the sacred grove raises a presumption that at Rome in the regal period, a ceremony was periodically performed exactly analogous to that which was annually celebrated at Athens down to the time of Aristotle. The marriage of the king of Rome to the oak goddess, like the wedding of the vine god to the queen of Athens, must have been intended to quicken the growth of vegetation by homeopathic magic. Of the two forms of the rite, we can hardly doubt that the Roman was the older, and that long before the northern invaders met with the vine on the shores of the Mediterranean, their forefathers had married the tree god to the tree goddess in the vast oak forests of central and northern Europe. In the England of our day, the forests have mostly disappeared, Yet still on many a village green, and in many a country lane, a faded image of the sacred marriage lingers in the rustic pageantry of May Day. Chapter 14. The Succession to the Kingdom in Ancient Latium In regard to the Roman king, whose priestly functions were inherited by his successor, the king of the sacred rites, the foregoing discussion has led us to the following conclusions. 
He represented, and indeed personated Jupiter, the great god of the sky, the thunder and the oak, and in the character made rain, thunder, and lightning for the good of his subjects. Like many more kings of the weather in the other parts of the world, Further, he not only mimicked the oak god by wearing an oak wreath and other insignia of divinity, but he was married to an oak nymph, Egeria, who appears to have been merely a local form of Diana in her character of a goddess of woods, of waters, and of childbirth. All these conclusions, which we have reached mainly by a consideration of the Roman evidence, may, with great probability, be applied to other Latin communities. They too probably had of old their divine or priestly kings who transmitted their religious functions without their civil powers to their successors, the kings of the sacred rites. But we have still to ask, what was the rule of succession to the kingdom among the old Latin tribes? According to tradition, there were in all eight kings of Rome, and with regard to the five last of them, at all events, we can hardly doubt that they actually sat on the throne, and that the traditional history of their reigns is, in its main outlines, correct. Now it is very remarkable that though the first king of Rome, Romulus, is said to have been descended from the royal house of Alba, in which the kingship is represented as hereditary in the male line, not one of the Roman kings was immediately succeeded by his son on the throne yet several left sons or grandsons behind them. On the other hand, one of them was descended from a former king through his mother, not through his father, and three of the kings, namely Tatius, the elder Tarquin, and Severus Tullius, were succeeded by their sons-in-law, who were all either foreigners or of foreign descent. This suggests that the right to the kingship was transmitted in the female line and was actually exercised by foreigners who married the royal princess. To put it in technical language, the succession to the kingship at Rome, and probably in Latium generally, would seem to have been determined by certain rules, which have molded early society in many parts of the world, namely exogamy, bina, marriage, and female kinship, or motherkin. Exogamy is the rule which obliges a man to marry a woman of a different clan from his own. Bina, marriage, is the rule that he must leave the home of his birth and live with his wife's people, and female kinship, or motherkin, is the system of tracing relationship and transmitting the family name through women instead of through men. If these principles regulated descent of the kingship amongst the ancient Latins, the state of things in this respect would be somewhat as follows. The political and religious center of each community would be the perpetual fire on the king's hearth, tended by vestal virgins of the royal clan. The king would be a man of another clan, perhaps another town or even another race, who had married a daughter of his predecessor and received the kingdom with her. The children whom he had by her would inherit their mother's name, not his. The daughters would remain at home. The sons, when they grew up, would go away into the world, marry and settle in their wives' country whether as kings or commoners. Of the daughters who stayed at home, some or all would be dedicated as vestal virgins for a longer or shorter time to the service of the fire on the hearth, and one of them would in time become the consort of her father's successor. This hypothesis has the advantage of explaining in a simple and natural way some obscure features in the traditional history of the Latin kingship. Thus, the legends, which tell how Latin kings were born of virgin mothers and divine fathers, became at least more intelligible, for, stripped of their fabulous element, tales of this sort mean no more than that a woman has been gotten with child by a man unknown, and this uncertainty as to fatherhood is more easily compatible with a system of kinship which ignores paternity than with one which makes it all-important. If at the birth of the Latin kings their fathers were really unknown, the fact points either to a general looseness of life in the royal family or to a special relaxation of moral rules on certain occasions, when men and women reverted for a season to the license of an earlier age. Such Saturnalias are not uncommon at some stages of social evolution. In our own country, traces of them long survived in the practices of May Day and Whitsuntide, if not of Christmas. Children born of more or less promiscuous intercourse, which characterizes festivals of this kind, would naturally be fathered on the god to whom the particular festival was dedicated. 
In this connection, it may be significant that a festival of jollity and drunkenness was celebrated by the plebeians and slaves at Rome on Midsummer Day, and that the festival was specially associated with the fireborn king, Servius Tullius, being held in honor of Fortuna, the goddess who loved Servius as Agiria loved Numa. The popular merrymakings at this season included foot races and boat races. The Tiber was gay with flower-wreathed boats in which young folk sat quaffing wine. The festival appears to have been a sort of midsummer Saturnalia, answering to the real Saturnalia, which fell at midwinter. In modern Europe, as we shall learn later on, the great midsummer festival has been above all a festival of lovers and of fire. One of its principal features is the pairing of sweethearts who leap over the bonfires hand in hand or throw flowers across the flames to each other, and many omens of love and marriage are drawn from the flowers which bloom at this mystic season. It is the time of the roses and of love. Yet the innocence and beauty of such festivals in modern times ought not to blind us to the likelihood that in earlier days they were marked by coarser features, which were probably of the essence of the rites. Indeed, among the rude Estonian peasantry, these features seem to have lingered down to our own generation, if not to the present day. One other feature in the Roman celebration of midsummer deserves to be specially noticed. The custom of rowing in flower-decked boats on the river on this day proves that it was to some extent a water festival, and water has always, down to modern times, played a conspicuous part in the rites of Midsummer Day, which explains why the church, in throwing its cloak over the old heathen festival, chose to dedicate it to St. John the Baptist. The hypothesis that the Latin kings may have been begotten at an annual festival of love is necessarily a mere conjecture, though the traditional birth of Numa at the festival of the Perilia, when the shepherds leaped across the spring bonfires as lovers leap across the midsummer fires, may perhaps be thought to lend it a faint color of probability. But it is quite possible that the uncertainty as to their fathers may not have arisen till long after the death of the kings, when their figures began to melt away into the cloudland of fable, assuming fantastic shapes and gorgeous coloring as they passed from earth to heaven. If they were alien immigrants, strangers, and pilgrims in the land they ruled over, it would be natural enough that the people should forget their lineage, and forgetting it should provide them with another, which made up in luster what it lacked in truth. The final apotheosis, which represented the kings not merely as sprung from gods, but as themselves deities incarnate, would be much facilitated if in their lifetime, as we have seen reason to think, they had actually laid claim to divinity. If among the Latins the women of royal blood always stayed at home and received as their consorts men of another stock, and often of another country, who reigned as kings in virtue of their marriage with a native princess, we can understand not only why foreigners wore the crown at Rome, but also why foreign names occur in the list of the Alban kings. In a state of society where nobility is reckoned only through women, in other words, where descent through the mother is everything, and descent through the father is nothing, no objection will be felt to to uniting girls of the highest rank to men of humble birth, even to aliens or slaves, provided that in themselves the men appear to be suitable mates. What really matters is that the royal stock, on which the prosperity and even the existence of the people is supposed to depend, should be perpetuated in a vigorous and efficient form. And for this purpose, it is necessary that the women of the royal family should bear children to men who are physically and mentally fit, according to the standard of early society, to discharge the important duty of procreation. Thus, the personal qualities of the kings at this stage of social evolution are deemed of vital importance. If they, like their consorts, are of royal and divine descent, so much the better, but it is not essential that they should be so. At Athens, as at Rome, we find traces of succession to the throne by marriage with a royal princess for two of the most ancient kings of Athens, namely Cecrops and Amphictyon, are said to have married the daughters of their predecessors. This tradition is to a certain extent confirmed by evidence pointing to the conclusion that at Athens male kinship was preceded by female kinship. Further, if I am right in supposing that in ancient Latium the royal families kept their daughters at home and sent forth their sons to marry princesses and reign among their wives' people, it will follow that the male descendants would reign in successive generations over different kingdoms. Now, this seems to have happened both in ancient Greece and in ancient Sweden, from which we may legitimately infer that it was a custom practiced by more than one branch of the Aryan stock in Europe. 
Many Greek traditions relate how a prince left his native land and going to a far country married the king's daughter and succeeded to the kingdom. Various reasons are assigned by ancient Greek writers for these migrations of the princes. A common one is that the king's son had been banished for murder. This would explain very well why he fled his own land, but it is no reason at all why he should become king of another. We may suspect that such reasons are afterthoughts devised by writers who, accustomed to the rule that a son should succeed to his father's property and kingdom, were hard put to it to account for so many traditions of king's sons who quitted the land of their birth to reign over a foreign kingdom. In Scandinavian tradition, we meet with traces of similar customs, where we read of daughters' husbands who received a share of the kingdom of their royal fathers-in-law, even when these fathers-in-law had sons of their own. In particular, during the five generations which preceded Harold the Fair-Haired, male members of the Inglinger family, which is said to have come from Sweden, are reported in the Heimskringla, or sagas of the Norwegian kings, to have obtained at least five provinces in Norway by marriage with the daughters of the local kings. Thus, it would seem that among some Aryan peoples, at a certain stage of their social evolution, it has been customary to regard women and not men as the channels in which royal blood flows, and to bestow the kingdom in each successive generation on a man of another family, and often of another country who marries one of the princesses and reigns over his wife's people. A common type of popular tale which relates how an adventurer coming to a strange land wins the hand of the king's daughter, and with her the half or the whole of the kingdom may well be a reminiscence of a real custom. Where usages and ideas of this sort prevail, it is obvious that the kingship is really an appendage of marriage with a woman of the blood royal. The old Danish historian Saxo Grammaticus puts this view of the kingship very clearly in the mouth of Hermitrude, a legendary queen of Scotland. Indeed, she was a queen, says Hermitrude, and but that her sex gainsaid it, might be deemed a king, nay, and this is yet truer. Whomsoever she thought worthy of her bed was at once a king, and she yielded her kingdom with herself. Thus her scepter and her hand went together. The placement is all the more significant because it appears to reflect the actual practice of the Pictish kings. We know from the testimony of Bede that whenever a doubt rose as to the succession, the Picts chose their kings from the female rather than the male line. The personal qualities which recommended a man for a royal alliance and succession to the throne would naturally vary according to the popular ideas of the time and the character of the king or his substitute, but it is reasonable to suppose that among them in early society, physical strength and beauty would hold a prominent place. Sometimes, apparently, the right to the hand of the princess and to the throne was determined by a race. The Alitemnian Libyans awarded the kingdom to the fleetest runner. Amongst the old Prussians, candidates for nobility raced on horseback to the king, and the one who reached him first was ennobled. According to tradition, the earliest games at Olympia were held by Endymion, who set his sons to run a race for the kingdom. His tomb was said to be at the point of the race course from which the runners started. The famous story of Pelops and Hippodamia is perhaps only another version of the legend that the first races of Olympia were run for no less a prize than a kingdom. These traditions may very well reflect a real custom of racing for a bride, for such a custom appears to have prevailed among various peoples, though in practice it has denigrated into a mere form or pretense. Thus, there is one race called the love chase, which may be considered a part of the form of marriage among the Kyrgyz. In this, the bride, armed with a formidable whip, mounts a fleet horse and is pursued by all the young men who make any pretensions to her hand. She will be given as a prize to the one who catches her. But she has the right, besides urging on her horse to the utmost, to use her whip, often with no mean force, to keep off those lovers who are unwelcome to her. And she will probably favor the one whom she has already chosen in her heart." The race for the bride is found also among the Koryaks of northeastern Asia. It takes place in a large tent, round which many separate communities, called Pologs, are arranged in a continuous circle. The girl gets a start and is clear of the marriage if she can run through all the compartments without being caught by the bridegroom. The women of the encampment place every obstacle in the man's way, tripping him up, belaboring him with switches, and so forth, so that he has little chance of succeeding unless the girl wishes it and waits for him. 
similar customs appear to have been practiced by the Teutonic peoples, for the German, Anglo-Saxon, and Norse languages possess in common a word for marriage which simply means bride race. Moreover, traces of the custom survived into modern times. Thus it appears that the right to marry a girl, and especially a princess, has often been conferred as a prize in an athletic contest. There would be no reason, therefore, for surprise if the Roman kings, before bestowing their daughters in marriage, should have resorted to this ancient mode of testing the personal qualities of their future sons-in-law and successors. If my theory is correct, the Roman king and queen personated Jupiter and his divine consort, and in the character of these divinities went through the annual ceremony of a sacred marriage, for the purpose of causing the crops to grow and men and cattle to be fruited and multiply. Thus they did what in more northern lands we may suppose the king and queen of May were believed to do in days of old. Now we have seen that the right to play the part of the king of May and to wed the queen of May has sometimes been determined by an athletic contest, particularly by a race. This may have been a relic of an old marriage custom of the sort we have examined, a custom designed to test the fitness of a candidate for matrimony. Such a test might reasonably be applied with peculiar rigor to the king in order to ensure that no personal defect should incapacitate him for the performance of those sacred rites and ceremonies on which, even more than on the dispatch of his civil and military duties, the safety and prosperity of the community were believed to depend, and it would be natural to require of him that from time to time he should submit himself afresh to the same ordeal for the sake of publicly demonstrating that he is still equal to the discharge of his high calling." A relic of that test perhaps survived in the ceremony known as the Flight of the King, Regifugium, which continued to be annually observed at Rome down to imperial times. On the 24th day of February, a sacrifice used to be offered in the Comitium, and when it was over, the King of the Sacred Rites fled from the Forum. We may conjecture that the Flight of the King was originally a race for an annual kingship, which may have been awarded as a prize to the fleetest runner. At the end of the year, the king might run again for a second term of office, and so on, until he was defeated and deposed or perhaps slain. In this way, what had once been a race would tend to assume the character of a flight and a pursuit. The king would be given a start. He ran and his competitors ran after him. And if he were overtaken, he had to yield the crown and perhaps his life to the lightest of foot among them. In a time, a man of masterful character might succeed in seating himself permanently on the throne and reducing the annual race or flight to the empty form, which it seems always to have been within historical times. The rite was sometimes interpreted as a commemoration of the expulsion of the kings from Rome, but this appears to have been a mere afterthought devised to explain a ceremony of which the old meaning was forgotten. It is far more likely that in acting thus, the king of the sacred rites was merely keeping up an ancient custom, which in the regal period had been annually observed by his predecessors, the kings. What the original intention of the rite may have been must probably always remain more or less a matter of conjecture. The present explanation is suggested with a full sense of the difficulty and obscurity in which the subject is involved. Thus, if my theory is correct, the yearly flight of the Roman kings was a relic of a time when the kingship was an annual office awarded, along with the hand of a princess, to the victorious athlete or gladiator, who thereafter figured along with his bride as a god and goddess at a sacred marriage designed to ensure the fertility of the earth by homeopathic magic. If I am right in supposing that in very early times the old Latin kings personated a god and were regularly put to death in that character, we can better understand the mysterious or violent ends to which so many of them are said to have come. We have seen that according to tradition, one of the kings of Alba was killed by a thunderbolt for impiously mimicking the thunder of Jupiter. Romulus is said to have vanished mysteriously like Aeneas, or to have been cut to pieces by the patricians whom he had defended, and the 7th of July, the day on which he perished, was a festival which bore some semblance to Saturnalia. For on that day, the female slaves were allowed to take certain remarkable liberties. They dressed up as free women in the attire of matrons and maids, and in this guise, they went forth from the city, scoffed and jeered at all whom they met, and engaged among themselves in a fight, striking and throwing stones at each other. 
Another Roman king who perished by violence was Tadius, the Sabine colleague of Romulus. It is said that he was at Lavinium, offering a public sacrifice to the ancestral gods, when some men, to whom he had given umbrage, dispatched him with the sacrificial knives and spits which they had snatched from the altar. The occasion and manner of his death suggest that the slaughter may have been a sacrifice rather than an assassination. Again, Tullius Hostilius, the successor of Numa, was commonly said to have been killed by lightning, but many held that he was murdered at the instigation of Ancus Marcius, who reigned after him. Speaking of the more or less mythical Numa, the type of the priestly king, Plutarch observes that his fame was enhanced by the fortunes of the later kings, for of the five who reigned after him, the last was deposed and ended his life in exile, and of the remaining four, not one died a natural death. For three of them were assassinated, and Tullius Hostilius was consumed by thunderbolts. These legends of the violent ends of the Roman kings suggest that the contest by which they gained the throne may sometimes have been a mortal combat rather than a race. If that were so, the analogy which we have traced between Rome and Nemi would be still closer. At both places, the sacred kings, the living representatives of the godhead, would thus be liable to suffer deposition and death at the hand of any resolute man who could prove his divine right to the holy office by the strong arm and the sharp sword. It would not be surprising if among the early Latins, the claim to the kingdom would often have been settled by single combat. For down to historical times, the Umbrians regularly submitted their private disputes to the ordeal of battle, and he who cut his adversary's throat was thought thereby to have proved the justice of his cause beyond the reach of cavil. Chapter 15. The Worship of the Oak the worship of the oak tree, or the oak god, appears to have been shared by all the branches of the Aryan stock in Europe. Both Greeks and Italians associated the tree with their highest god, Zeus or Jupiter, the divinity of the sky, the rain, and the thunder. Perhaps the oldest, and certainly one of the most famous sanctuaries in Greece, was that of Dodona, where Zeus was revered in the oracular oak. The thunderstorms which were said to rage at Dodona more frequently than anywhere else in Europe, would render the spot a fitting home for the god whose voice was heard alike in the rustling of the oak leaves and in the crash of thunder. Perhaps the bronze gongs, which kept up a humming in the wind round the sanctuary, were meant to mimic the thunder that might so often be heard rolling and rumbling in the combs of the stern and barren mountains, which shut in the gloomy valley. In Boeotia, as we have seen, the sacred marriage of Zeus and Hera, the oak god and the oak goddess, appears to have been celebrated with much pomp by a religious federation of states. And on Mount Lysaeus, in Arcadia, the character of Zeus as god, both of the oak and of the rain, comes out clearly in the rain charm practiced by the priest of Zeus, who dipped an oak branch in a sacred spring. In his latter capacity, Zeus was the god to whom the Greeks regularly prayed for rain. Nothing could be more natural, for often, though not always, he had his seat on the mountains, where the clouds gather and the oaks grow. On the Acropolis at Athens, there was an image of earth praying to Zeus for rain, and in time of drought, the Athenians themselves prayed, Rain, rain, O dear Zeus, on the cornland of the Athenians and on the plains. Again, Zeus wielded the thunder and lightning as well as the rain. At Olympia and elsewhere, he was worshipped under the surname of Thunderbolt, and at Athens there was a sacrificial hearth of lightning, Zeus on the city wall, where some priestly officials watched for lightning over Mount Parnas at certain seasons of the year. Further spots, which had been struck by lightning, were regularly fenced in by the Greeks, and consecrated to Zeus, the descender, that is, to the god who came down in the flash from heaven. Altars were set up within these enclosures and sacrifices offered on them. Several such places are known from inscriptions to have existed in Athens. Thus, when ancient Greek kings claimed to be descended from Zeus and even to bear his name, we may reasonably suppose that they also attempted to exercise his divine functions by making thunder and rain for the good of their people or the terror and confusion of their foes. In this respect, the legend of Salomonius probably reflects the pretensions of a whole class of petty sovereigns who reigned of old, each over his little canton, in the oak-clad highlands of Greece. Like their kinsmen, the Irish kings, they were expected to be a source of fertility to the land and of fecundity to the cattle. And how could they fulfill these expectations better than by acting the part of their kinsman Zeus, the great god of the oak, the thunder, and the rain? 
They personified him, apparently, just as the Italian kings personified Jupiter. In ancient Italy, every oak was sacred to Jupiter, the Italian counterpart of Zeus. And on the capital at Rome, the god was worshipped as the deity, not merely of the oak, but of the rain and the thunder. Contrasting the piety of the good old times with the skepticism of an age when nobody thought that heaven was heaven, or cared a fig for Jupiter, a Roman writer tells us that in former days, noble matrons used to go with bare feet, streaming hair, and pure minds up the long Capiline slopes, praying to Jupiter for rain. And straight away, he goes on, it rained buckets full, then or never, and everybody returned dripping like drowned rats. But nowadays, says he, we are no longer religious, so the fields lie baking. When we pass from southern to central Europe, we still meet with the great god of the oak and the thunder among the barbarous Aryans who dwelt in the vast primeval forests. Thus, among the Celts of Gaul, the Druids esteemed nothing more sacred than the mistletoe and the oak on which it grew. They chose groves of oaks for the scene of their solemn service, and they performed none of their rites without oak leaves. The Celts, says a Greek writer, worship Zeus, and the Celtic image of Zeus is a tall oak. The Celtic conquerors who settled in Asia in the 3rd century before our era appear to have carried the worship of the oak with them to their new home. For in the heart of Asia Minor, the Galatian Senate met in a place which bore the pure Celtic name of Drynametum, the sacred oak grove, or the temple of the oak. Indeed, the very name of Druids is believed by good authorities to mean no more than oak men. In the religion of the ancient Germans, the veneration for sacred groves seems to have held the foremost place, and according to Grimm, the chief of their holy trees was the oak. It appears to have been especially dedicated to the god of thunder, Donor, or Thunar, the equivalent of the Norse Thor. For a sacred oak near Geismer, in Hesse, which Boniface cut down in the 8th century, went among the heathen by the name of Jupiter's oak, Robert Jovis, which in Old German would be Donar Esai, the oak of Donar. That the Teutonic thunder god Donar, Thunar, and Thor was identified with the Italian thunder god Jupiter appears from the word Thursday, Thunar's day, which is merely a rendering of the Latin Dies Jovis. Thus, among the ancient Teutons, as among the Greeks and Italians, the god of the oak was also the god of the thunder. Moreover, he was regarded as the great fertilizing power who sent rain and caused the earth to bear fruit. For Adam of Bremen tells us that Thor presides in the air. He it is who rules thunder and lightning, wind and rains, fine weather and crops. In these respects, therefore, the Teutonic thunder god again resembled his southern counterparts, Zeus and Jupiter. Amongst the Slavs also, the oak appears to have been the sacred tree of the thunder god Perun, the counterpart of Zeus and Jupiter. It is said that at Novgorod, there used to stand an image of Perun in the likeness of a man with a thunderstone in his hand. A fire of oak wood burned day and night in his honor. And if ever it went out, the attendants paid for their negligence with their lives. Perun seems, like Zeus and Jupiter, to have been the chief god of his people, for Procopius tells us that the Slavs believe that one god, the maker of lightning, is alone lord of all things, and they sacrifice to him oxen and every victim. The chief deity of the Lithuanians was Perkunas, or Perkuns, the god of thunder and lightning, whose resemblance to Zeus and Jupiter has often been pointed out. Oaks were sacred to him, and when they were cut down by the Christian missionaries, the people loudly complained that their sylvan deities were destroyed. Perpetual fires kindled with the wood of certain oak trees were kept up in honor of Perkunas. If such a fire went out, it was lighted again by friction of the sacred wood. Men sacrificed to oak trees for good crops, while women did the same to lime trees, from which we may infer that they regarded oaks as male and lime trees as female. And in time of drought, when they wanted rain, they used to sacrifice a black heifer, a black he-goat, and a black cock to the thunder god in the depths of the woods. On such occasions, the people assembled in great numbers from the country round about, ate and drank, and called upon Percunus. They carried a bowl of beer thrice round the fire, then poured the liquor on the flames, while they prayed to the god to send showers. Thus, the chief Lithuanian deity presents a close resemblance to Zeus and Jupiter, since he was the god of the oak, the thunder, and the rain.
From the foregoing survey, it appears that the god of the oak, the thunder, and the rain was worshipped of old by all the main branches of the Aryan stock in Europe, and was indeed the chief deity of their pantheon. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. We will be back in two weeks with our next installment. In the meantime, you can catch up with our other pod, Midwest Covencast. Consider supporting Midwest Covencast and Weekend Reads on our Patreon to gain access to additional content and exclusive coven merch. You can even join our coven by following us on social media at Midwest Covencast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. You can also keep up with us on our website, MidwestCovenCast.com. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.